By popular request, I wanted to do a video covering under eye rejuvenating treatments, under eye wrinkles, under eye bags, under eye hollows, under eye dark circles. After watching this video, you'll learn a little bit more about under eye treatments to rejuvenate that area. Oh, a little doggy. <laughs> Hi my beauties, I wanted to do a video on under eye rejuvenation. How to treat under eye bags, how to treat under eye hollows, how to treat under eye puffiness, how to treat under eye dark circles. This is probably my most requested area in my clinic every day. The under eye area is the first to show our age. It even starts in our 20s because that skin is so thin and delicate that it's the first to show signs of aging. With even the most minimal amount of collagen loss or loss of elasticity, we start to notice those changes under the eyes. So I wanted to dedicate a video just to under eye rejuvenation and because it's the most requested area to be treated in my office, I've done this video before but I wanted to do another one for you guys just to kind of update you and keep you guys in the know with new and advanced treatments for this area and also a combination of treatments to keep the under eye nice and smooth and tight over time. And I literally look like a glazed donut, I know because I have so many layers of serums on my skin, but even on my neck and chest, these serums are gonna be working hard for me while I go about my business and help keep my skin healthy on a cellular level. So I've done videos on this before, and the most important thing to understand is that there's three major, three major, I'm using my hydrator, there's three major changes that happen under the eyes as we gain wisdom and have birthdays. And number one is we have a loss of collagen. We also have like a loss of elastin, a loss of collagen, a loss of those extracellular matrix proteins that help keep the under eye nice and smooth and tight. So as we lose those extracellular matrix proteins, we start to see crepiness, we start to see under eye laxity, fine lines, wrinkles, and that's all from a loss of collagen and elastin and a thinning of the epidermis and a thinning of the dermis and a thinning of the subcutaneous fat that happens over time. It may be present earlier in some people. It may be a genetic predisposition and an anatomical variant, which worsens as we get older, or you may be nice and smooth and tight under your eyes while you're young. And then as you start to, you know, enter your late twenties and early thirties, you start to notice these changes. And that's why. So you have a loss of collagen and elastin, or what you call extracellular matrix proteins that give skin that nice, smooth, tight turgor. You can also have thinning of the skin that can show the underlying vasculature under the eyes, which will give like a blue purple discoloration. And that those dark circles is because of that skin being thin to begin with or thinning over time, which shows that underlying vasculature, which can kind of that, give that dusky bluish purple hue or make you look like sick or tired or like you haven't slept in days because you have those dark circles under your eyes. The third thing that happens is you can get volume loss. Now volume loss can happen from the fat pads, which is the subcutaneous fat under the eyes. The fat pads in our face like retract and kind of separate over time so you can get what we call a tear trough or under eye hollow and that's kind of that like hollowing. They can almost make it look like we have dark circles under eyes because of like, that like shadowing effect. So volume loss can also cause like the festoons which sometimes people have like a little indentation here as those fat pads separate. So that's more volume loss. So you have loss of collagen and elasticity, you have the underlying vasculature that shows through the skin, and then you have um, volume loss. And those are like the three main categories to kind of keep in mind when we're talking about under eye rejuvenation, whether it's going to be a laser, a tightening device, um, a surgery, or tear trough filler, you know, all these different things that happen that can help rejuvenate the under eye area is all determined by what changes are happening in you personally and what mechanism of action of which treatment is going to target those changes best. And it may be just one treatment or it may be like a combination of treatments. Say for example, you have dark circles under your eyes because you have more melanin or pigmentation in the skin and that's a genetic you know, inheritance or a hereditary darkening under the skin and we have to do a little bit of laser to kind of get rid of the brown, the brown or the hyperpigmentation or the dark circles under the eyes. But then you also have a little bit of collagen loss and you have a loss of elasticity there so we have to do a little energy-based device or a skin tightening device to kind of stimulate collagen and tighten the under eye. Or say you have a little bit of volume loss because you know you've 
gain wisdom and have birthdays and you've lost some volume over time and it's making you look like you're tired. So we do a little bit of filler in there to kind of help rejuvenate that area and add in that volume that has been lost to smooth out that eyelid cheek junction, but there's still a little discoloration there because of underlying vasculature. Then we'll do a little V-beam. So it may be a combination of different things and it's always important to know what changes are happening to you and know what treatments targeted for those changes because a lot of times people will do the wrong treatment for the wrong change. For example, if they have under eye wrinkles, they'll go to a provider who gives them a bunch of filler. Filler's not what you use to erase wrinkles under the eyes. Filler's what you use to restore volume loss if needed. Lasers, energy-based devices like Fraxel, CO2, chemical peels, those are the things that we do to eliminate fine lines or wrinkles. If you get into the habit of filling under eyes to puff up the eyes so you don't have fine lines or wrinkles, you're gonna start getting that weird cat-like faces or that weird look where you're like overfilled and swollen and your eyes you know, get small when you smile and it's just a weird look because that's not the right treatment for that change. So hopefully after watching this video, it'll explain these differences to you and you can kind of think like a dermatologist on how you would approach these changes in a very methodical, very scientific way to give the most natural looking beautiful results. So now everybody always makes fun of me for being so shiny, including my kids, but you can see up close, that's all my serums <laughs> gonna work for me. Now I'm gonna put a layer of sunscreen over it so I'm not so shiny. I know you guys wanna know what I've done. I just did a V-beam under my, my sleeves are always too long. I did V-beam under my eyes to eliminate my dark circles, I do that two or three times a year. I don't know why I'm whispering. Um, I do Fraxel under my eyes very regularly, probably once or twice a year. I have done CO2 and I have done Thermage. I've done Thermage like three or four times under my eyes to keep the eyelids get nice and smooth and tight, but I don't have any filler there. That's something for me personally, I just, I, would, I wouldn't do because my eyes are already like small enough as it is. I wouldn't want to do any filler for under eye volume loss and I don't have that much volume loss under my eyes yet but yes I know I haven't reached menopause and everything goes south when you reach menopause you guys always remind me that in the comments but when the time comes and I do need to draw filler I will do it but for right now I've just been able to get away with doing energy based devices and um, V-beam and Fraxel that's my jam that's my trio for my eyes and I've been doing this since like my early 20s and I'm 46 now so let's talk about treatments I wouldn't do under my eyes I honestly you guys I would avoid microneedling under my eyes I know that there's like a lot of like at home microneedling like pens and treatments but I've had a number of patients come into my office who were trying to do a good thing and be like preventative and do like under eye microneedling or derma pen or one of those treatments and it just causes hyperpigmentation and sometimes volume loss so I have more than enough patients who have had to see me for like lasers to reverse hyperpigmentation or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that has happened from um, microneedling under the eyes, which actually they're trying to do a good thing, but instead they ended up having like dark circles under the eyes when before they were just doing it for preventative measures and they were perfect to begin with or trying to do it for prevention. Um, another thing I wouldn't do under the eyes is Kybella. A lot of people ask that. So Kybella is deoxycholic acid. It's a fat reducing injectable. Um, it's a naturally occurring enzyme that it occurs in the GI tract. Deoxycholic acid was an enzyme that was harvested um, to melt fat. It was FDA approved for like submental or double chin fat reduction. I use it all the time for body contouring to like get rid of fat in like back fat, bra fat, abdominal fat, medial thigh fat, knee fat, all the things, but I wouldn't do it under the eyes. And a lot of people have come in asking for Kybella to reduce those um, fat pads under the eyes, but that's not what you'd want to do. So if you put Kybella there, it's too much of a good thing. You're going to become like sunken and like with all that volume loss under the eyes. So I wouldn't do Kybella under the eyes. Um, the other thing you have to be really careful with is Botox under the eyes because Botox under the eyes, you have to go to someone who really knows what they're doing because if you do too much or in the wrong place, you can have horrific side effects and you have to walk around with that for like three to six months if it's Botox. If it's Daxify, probably even longer. So just, I do do under eye Botox for select patients, but if you're a patient of mine, you know I always have you animate before I inject. I'm very methodical and very strategic with where I put the units because you know you can do a little bit like micro droplets along the lower um, 
under eye area to help minimize under eye wrinkles. But if you get it too close to the lacrimal gland, then you'll have problems with tearing. If you do it too close to, and you knock out the, um, you know, one of the muscles that helps hold the eyelid against the globe of the eye, then you'll get like an atropion. And then you're gonna like walk around looking like this for three months, which not only looks bad, but you're gonna get like a corneal abrasion because your eyes are gonna be dried out because you're not having that mucosal surface you will be juxtaposed to the globe of your eye. So just be really, really careful. Do I do Botox under the eye? Yes, but select patients, and I do it differently for everyone just based on their anatomy and how the, what their muscle recruitment looks like. Another thing to know about Botox for under the eye, because Botox is great for the crow's feet area, but another thing to know about Botox under the eye is that um, it can temporarily kind of impede your body's lymphatic drainage. So if you do gua sha, or if you do like lymphatic um, drainage maneuvers on your face or your skin, that will help. But temporarily, once the obicularis muscle gets softened, especially for the treatment of crow's feet, you your muscles are responsible with facial animation for mobilizing that lymphatic drainage of that fluid out of your face. And if your muscles are over Botox or there's too much there, then you get this kind of like puffiness around your eyes you can get above above your eye too um it usually lasts for like three or four days and then it'll go away and then your botox will kick in and you'll have those results that last three to six months but the reason why you can temporarily get that puffiness around your eyes is because it's hard for your muscles to mobilize to mobilize that fluid and it accumulates there and that especially happens with um, infraorbital botox too now i know you guys are going to ask me about jelly roll botox usually when the patient looks the gaze is straight ahead and up and you do like one or two units actually just one or half a unit like right here I, if i do two units it would be like one and one but again this is not a channel for medical advice i'm just explaining these things to you guys so as patients you're more informed when you go to your provider and you ask for these services um, but if you do a uh, jelly roll botox it can help with that little crease here but you have to be very careful because i see people outside of my office do this wrong they make their patients have these horrible side effects and then they come running to me to fix it so careful with under eye botox it can be useful but it can also hurt you too so just be, be careful okay guys for sure i'm going to be peeling in this video today i'm like i just did way too much tretinoin just don't judge me this is authentic this is real life and i could just not do this video until my skin's healed but i'm not going to stop and i'm going to do it it's authentic it's real life i'm peeling i did too much tretinoin i'm guilty but the benefits are good but i did use too much and too high of a person i always put these on either in the morning or at night and I leave them on for 20 minutes and it just helps with minimizing the appearance of under eye puffiness, dark circles, fine lines, and wrinkles. The key with under eye masks, it's really important because the active ingredients in the under eye masks is really important because you want it to drive hydration and antioxidants, actives, green tea, polyphenols, all of the things into the skin because with the wrong formulation, it can actually extract hydration and natural moisturization factors out of the skin so it can actually do you a disservice so it's always really important to make sure that you're getting under eye masks that are going to drive hydration in not suck it out okay so it's been about 20 minutes and i'm going to take these off now so you can see my under eye is nice and bright and tight oh my gosh it's so good i love the feeling after i take off my under eye masks now I'm putting on my ECM eye serum, MD Air. So just make sure that your eye serum, I'm not a big proponent of having retinol or um, vitamin C or anything that could be potentially irritating under the eye because that under eye skin is just different than skin on the face. It has a different histologic composition of like sebaceous glands and glandular tissue. The epidermis and dermis is thinner than other areas of the face. And just when studying the skin under the microscope and looking at the skin under the microscope for decades as a Mohs micrographic skin cancer surgeon, you can really appreciate the histologic difference between the skin from under the eyes and skin from other areas of the face, like the cheeks, the nose, the forehead, that skin's just different. So it needs different active ingredients to um, give all the effects that we want to have under the eyes, whether that's you know diminishing the appearance of dark circles or improving fine lines and wrinkles. So if anybody tells you otherwise, they're either 
uneducated in this area or they didn't spend time looking at skin histology under the microscope and they don't have an appreciation for it and they don't know their pharmacokinetics very well. So on top of my ECM eye serum, I always use my Color Science 3-in-1 Total Eye. So this has a really cool applicator. Again, I'm non-sponsored by Color Science. I just really love their um, sunscreens and their skincare products. It also not only blocks um, UVA1, UVA2, and UVB rays that can cause photo damage and skin cancer, but it also um, blocks environmental pollutants that could be um, destructive for you know breaking down collagen, increasing collagenases and matrix metalloproteinases, which basically in English what that means is, you know, environmental pollutants, blue light emitted from our devices, things like that can cause breaking down of collagen and breaking down of elastin fibers. So this is not only a sunscreen that's gonna photo protect, but also protect your skin from, you know, the deleterious, you know, harmful effects of um, environmental pollutants and um, blue light and uh, visible light emitted from our devices every day. There we go. So I have extra added protection under the eyes. Bill, what's your favorite under eye treatment? With lasers. Uh, Fraxel? Yay, mine too. Actually, maybe beeping. A big swell just came in and we live right on the on the water and my son is a competitive surfer he's on the surf team and he competes and he's out there right now and I'm super scared because the swell just came in and the waves are like ginormous so we're gonna walk and talk and as I go down there to make sure that he's doing okay walk and talk about under eye rejuvenation a little bit more oh my gosh you guys the waves are so big right now they're huge i gotta get my little grommet out of there out of the ocean before he gets pummeled although he's probably having the time of his life right now hi how are you good to see you. i know it's huge right now i need to make sure pj's not getting <laughs> i know he has his helmet on he has to surf with a helmet it's that big it's just so crazy but he loves it and i grew up surfing and i love it too but when it's this big, mama's gotta be out on the front lines on the sand watching him to make sure that it's safe. Okay, so under eye rejuvenation. So talking about preventative measures, there are preventative measures that you can start as early as your 20s and your 30s. Um, but again, that's not to say if you haven't started doing preventative measures and you're starting to see under eye changes, that's never too late. You know, we can definitely reverse changes. I have women, you know, in their 50s and 60s who have never done laser and they have crepey thin skin under the eye. And, you know, we do some resurfacing laser treatments like Fraxel or CO2 or combined um, thermage with Fraxel, which we call thermal and we can definitely like turn it around and I feel like anytime you do things that are going to stimulate collagen stimulate elastin synthesis and kind of stimulate your body's own regenerative processes to smooth out those fine lines and wrinkles that's always a much better option than surgery or filler or something that's just going to be temporary or artificial beautiful when it comes to lasers there's different types of lasers that you can use to rejuvenate the eyes so we've already talked about Fraxel we can talk about clear and brilliant which is a less aggressive kind of lower tiered laser for resurfacing which is going to stimulate collagen and stimulate elastin and increase upregulation and synthesis of those extracellular matrix proteins which makes the skin under the eye firm and tight and smooth by adding in the collagen and the elastin and those healthy fibers that keep the turgor of the skin smooth and taut and tight. Um, but you can also use more ablative lasers, which are a little bit stronger, more downtime, more discomfort during the treatment. Usually we use topical numbing cream, and if we need to, we use nerve blocks or even other forms of anesthesia. Um, I personally don't in my office. Um, I usually use just either um, topical numbing, and if that's not enough, we'll do some like nerve blocks or some injectable local anesthetic. But I don't want to do lasers that are going to make patients so uncomfortable that they need um, you know, general anesthesia or IV sedation. I just don't perform lasers that are that aggressive. Um, because I feel I don't need to. We get great results with um, the result with the lasers that we have um, in office with just the use of um, local anesthetic or numbing cream. 
Um, but to get back on the point, you have you know your non-ablative lasers, which are like you know clear and brilliant, fraxel, and then you kind of have a hybrid of ablative and non-ablative, which is what a halo is. I personally don't have a halo laser. I like halo. I just like fraxel restore better. I get better results with fraxel restore, in my opinion, because I've worked in offices where I've had both. Um, but that's not to say halo is not good. I think a halo is a great laser too, if that's the only option in an area where you live. Um, but other more aggressive, stronger lasers would include like an Erbium or a CO2. So those are what we call fully ablative lasers. And fully ablative lasers under the eyes can really help upregulate collagen stimulation and elastin synthesis, and that's going to help smooth and tighten and firm the under eye area. Um, again, there's more downtime um, with, associated with that procedure, but, but the results are next level. So a question that I often get is, well, if I do three fraxel treatments, which are non-ablative, would that equal the results of one CO2? And usually the answer is like a three to one ratio. Same with clear and brilliant, which is a lower, you know, kind of, I don't want to say lower tier laser because it's a great laser. It's just, you know, a little bit more mild. So three clear and brilliance will kind of equal like a fraxel non-ablative laser treatment. Just as like three fraxel non-ablative laser treatments will equal the results of one CO2 fully ablative. And just to get into the difference between ablative and non-ablative lasers, I've done other videos on this discussing the differences in lasers, but ablative lasers actually vaporize and remove tissue, and non-ablative lasers just heat up that tissue to stimulate collagen synthesis and elastin synthesis and those extracellular matrix proteins that are going to tighten the skin without actually removing any skin. So that's why non-ablative lasers like Fraxel or um, Clear and Brilliant or any other non-ablative lasers aren't going to have that pinpoint bleeding that the ablative lasers will have, like a CO2 or an Erbium. So that's kind of the difference. And you just have to pick, you know, what fits best with your, you know, your downtime, your fear factor, your pain tolerance, the results you want. Like, do you want to take a slow and steady approach to your results? Or do you just want to get it done, get it done fast? You don't only have one week of downtime and you just want to get it finished and you're willing to undergo a little bit more discomfort. I mean, it's still not the most painful thing, but it's also not the most pleasant. So every individual is different. And, um, you know, I always like to work with my patients and see, would you rather do a stepwise approach to your goal or do, do you want to just hit it once and hit it hard and be done with it? Um, and so that's kind of how we um, come to decide what under eye resurfacing laser would be best. And then for the sake of completeness, um, you can combine lasers with other treatments. For example, Thermage, which is one of my favorite energy-based devices. We can combine Fraxel with Thermage, which we call Thermofrax. And it's like a one plus one equals three reaction because you're stimulating collagen synthesis deeper and more superficially and you're getting like a full thickness effect in the skin and they synergistically augment the results of one another. So doing Thermage and Fraxel together is a great way to really target the under eye area. Um, you can also do chemical peels in, in conjunction with lasers. So if you do a light peel, like a TCA or glycolic acid peel, or even like a phenol peel, I don't personally do that, but I've seen my colleagues um, present this at meetings when we're all at their podium lecturing together, and they get great results. And sometimes you can combine like a fraxel laser with like, you know, a Zeo blue peel or um, just a peel that is like maybe a 20% TCA for under the eyes. And again, disclaimer, I'm not giving medical education or lecturing, um, you know, the protocols to do this, but it is an option that some providers can um, give to their patients who want to do combined therapy. So energy-based devices with lasers or peels with lasers as well work really, really well together. Oh my gosh, you guys, it is so big. You need to see how big these waves are. Surf set. So for other lasers under the eyes, um, you know, sometimes the dark circles under the eyes isn't from underlying vasculature or thin skin. Sometimes it is secondary to melanin, which is pigmentation that's in the skin. Now that could be genetically inherited. Um, it could come from sometimes post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, like if people use too much retinol under the eyes and they get hyperpigmented in response, or say they do, you know, microneedling, God forbid, under their eyes, and then they get post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation under the eyes. That is usually melanin, which is the pigment in our skin that accumulates under the eyes. And because that thin, that skin is thin under the eyes, when it gathers, it looks even darker. So there are lasers that can help brighten that area um, when it is secondary to melanin, and those usually have to do with like you know the wavelength that targets melanin specifically it could be a YAG which is a 1064 it can actually be a Pico or Q-switched um, 532 it, nanometer wavelength I'm talking like laser physics now so I don't want to make this too technical or scientific but there's different lasers that target melanin or pigment I like Pico because Pico 
um, is a picosecond, which is a trillionth of a second. It's a very fast, meaning there's a photoacoustic, no photothermal reaction. And in English, what that means is there's no dissipation of heat. So it's going to treat the melanin in the darkness without causing more heat that would cause post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Because you don't want to do a laser that's going to erase the brown spots, but then you become, you know, hyperpigmented from the laser itself. So that's why I really like Pico and Pico toning for the under eye area. Um, I also really like Clear and Brilliant. The 1927 nanometer handpiece on the Clear and Brilliant is a very safe and effective treatment to erase under eye discoloration in dark circles, especially in skin types three, four, five, and six, because many people don't know this, but Clear and Brilliant was actually engineered to treat um, darker skin tones. And that was a big um, part of my laser fellowship training was treating skin of color. And it's, you know, it takes a certain wavelength and certain and settings to do that safely and effectively because you don't want to depigment or hyperpigment the skin. Ooh, it's coming up to get me. So typically, you know, hydroquinone or even some non-hydroquinone skin brighteners that are safer to use long term can be used under the eye. I always say apply it delicately with like a cotton tipped applicator so that doesn't get into the eye and just be really vigilant and di diligent when you're applying any topicals or actives to the under eye area. I'm not a big proponent of using vitamin C or retinol um, under the eyes. When it's in the form of like a hypercellulose gel mask, that's different. But as far as like serums, I don't like to use too strong of actives because it can actually cause irritation and hyperpigment the skin long term or it can even get into the um, conjunctiva or the globe of the eye and cause you know corn you know coronary ulceration or coronary abrasion um, or irritation to the eye or conjunctivitis so just be really careful around the eyes um, but you can use like a hydroquinone or melanocyte stabilizing topical active um, to help lighten up the under eye area and many eye serums will have um, either vasoconstricting or lightening and brightening actives in it so like my ecm eye serum from mdr that was actually the first product i formulated more for myself i wanted a really legit amazing you know technologically advanced eye serum for myself and for my patients and for you mom if you're watching so i engineered oh my gosh you guys have to see this wave so i engineered the ecm eye serum um, for that reason so ECMI serum just has, you know, caffeine in it, green tea polyphenols, um, it has niacinamide, polypodium leucotomus. These are active ingredients that are going to vasoconstrict, which is going to help with under eye puffiness and dark circles, but also stabilize the melanocytes so they don't hyper produce melanin and pigmentation. Um, it's also going to lighten any existing pigmentation that's under the eye. So typically for dark circles, I'll evaluate a patient and see and say, is your are your dark circles from melanin? And if so, we'll use the laser to kind of target that. Or is it from the underlying vasculature that's giving like a bluish, you know, darkish discoloration or hue under the eye? And then, you know, we'll combine, sometimes we'll combine V-beam with a YAG or with a Pico or with a 1927 nanometer handpiece on Clear and Brilliant to brighten up the under eyes. And, you know, we'll use in conjunction um, skincare that's going to help stabilize those melanocytes as well. Um, so I always say like doing lasers or in-office procedures is kind of like going to the gym and then using your topicals and your skincare afterwards is like eating clean or, you know, eating your protein. So they kind of go hand in hand and they, uh, when they're together, they just give the best results always and they knock it out of the park. Something that comes up a lot also is, um, you know, people say, my provider doesn't do lasers around the eyes. That's perfect, that's fine. If they are not comfortable doing lasers around the eyes, then you do not want them touching your eyes with a laser. Um, usually it requires the placement of an intraocular eye shield to protect the eye. And many people don't know how to put those in. And if they don't know how to put them in, then they shouldn't be messing with lasers around the eyes. That's kind of my, that's kind of my criteria. There's a lot that goes into it for treating the under eye and periorbital skin. And a lot of providers aren't comfortable or not trained to do it. So if a provider tells you, oh no, you can't do that around the eye, just be like, thank you. I'll be, you know, trying to get treatment elsewhere. We don't have to tell them that. But then just look up, you know, the credentials of maybe a laser surgeon in your area. Don't let anybody tell you you can't treat the under eye because that's just not true. They just may not be able to treat you because they don't know how. One more thing I wanted to mention is, is that there's different eye shields that need to be placed in the eye depending on what laser or device you're having done to your eyelids. For example, a thermod, and I'm just saying this for any like maybe new up and coming injectors or um, laser surgeons, all the medical students, residents and fellows, if you follow me, this is really important and you'll learn this. But this is even more important to people who 
have opened a Medi Spa and don't have any traditional or official training or you know um, accredited training in lasers. Lasers and energy-based devices are really amazing treatments, but they can be very dangerous in the wrong hands. So for example, when you do thermofrax, you're doing thermage, you have to put in a thermage intraocular eye shield to protect the eye. It's a black plastic intraocular eye shield that goes in the eye. When you do the fraxal part of it, you have to take the thermage eye protection out and put in a fraxal intraocular eye shield, which is a metal eye shield. If you switch the two or someone doesn't know what they're doing and they do a fraxal treatment with the plastic in there, it'll be catastrophic. If they do a thermage with a metal intraocular eye shield that's intended for fraxal, it'd be catastrophic. So that's just something that you don't mess around with. So I'll have like a lot of other doctors say, Dr. Kappel, can I have your settings or can I have your protocol? I don't give that out because I feel like if you need to ask another provider for that, you should probably do a laser fellowship or do like intense laser training before you even practice this on other people. That's just my two cents. And I want to empower you guys and educate you to protect you from bad things happening to you. We're back in the house now and sorry, pardon my messy bedroom. There's Christmas presents that I still need to pack. There's some Legos. I think there's like a bag of slime and stuff that I still have to pack for some of the um, kiddos. So anyway, I wanted to mention, you can see, so I usually use a tretinoin. I usually use 0 0.025 and I use it um, once a week and I mix it with my NMF hydrator. And I was doing skincare with my daughter the other night and I actually ran out of my 0 0.025 and I used my 0 0.05 tret and I put it on my face and I usually put on my hydrator first and I do a one-to-one -one pea sized amount of my tretinone with two pumps of my hydrator and I put it on my face but I let Riley do it and she had a really fun time or my daughter do it and she had a really fun time mixing it up and she put it like all over my face and just kind of like overdid it a little bit so if you see little like pieces of skin flaking off I'm just retinized and I'm desquamating so I know I'm gonna probably get a bunch of comments on that, but you know what, it's real life, it's authentic, this is what my skin looks like, it's peeling off, I use too much tretinoin, but I am a firm believer in tretinoin, but I usually only do it once a week because it's, you know, it's my skin's really sensitive to it. Anyway, so I wanted to move on. Let's talk about under eye surgery and under eye blepharoplasty because this comes up a lot in my office as well because as a dermatologist, with my lasers and my tightening devices, all the things that I can do, it's not going to, come close to what an under eye surgery or lower lip blepharoplasty can achieve. And so for the right candidate, when it's beyond something I can improve, I usually refer to my oculoplastics colleagues. Oh my God, was my mic not on that entire time? I might have to do that whole video again, but I'm gonna have to do it tomorrow because I hear my kids coming home and I have to make dinner. Oh my gosh, I don't think that, I don't think that mic was working. So what is, what is under eye blepharoplasty and what does that entail? So a lower eyelid blepharoplasty or under eye surgery usually is when an oculoplastic surgeon, and I usually prefer oculoplastic surgeons instead of plastic surgeons who perform these procedures as kind of like, you know, one out of many surgeries they do because oculoplastics, when they're trained just specifically for oculoplastics, it's, it's a very um, cosmetically sensitive area, like one millimeter off and your results can be not ideal. So I really um, recommend you to go to oculoplastic surgeons who are highly trained for periorbital surgery. Like you don't want a breast augmentation specialist or a facelift specialist doing your bluff. I did, that's just how I practice and you know as a laser specialist I feel like I'm you know a master of my skill and my craft but you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, um, do something that was out of my scope of practice. So I always recommend going to oculoplastics if you want to um, lower lip blepharoplasty. And what that entails is they basically just transposition that fat pad. So the fat pad, which is that kind of puffy area under your eyes, can happen because the fat pads separate and they retract and sometimes they herniate through the skin as it gets thinner as we get older. So you'll have these like fat pads under the eyes, which is just basically a herniated fat pad that happens, you know, as we age. And so what the surgeons will do through inside the eye, I know it sounds scary, but you're usually under IV sedation and you're very comfortable. They'll go in through the eyelid and they basically detach that fat pad and they reposition it and tack it down lower in the face. So then they maintain that smooth eyelid cheek junction, which is very youthful and very beautiful. So instead of removing the fat pad, which is what you don't want to do, which is what some of the old school surgeons will do, they'll remove the fat pad because you know it's protuberant and it's and it's puffing out. But then 
you'll have to see your dermatologist like me to refill that area with filler and that's not a good long-term plan you know you want the the newer school and like the younger oculoplastic surgeons have been trained a different way where they just reposition and transposition that fat pad they don't remove the fat so that's what a, a lower lip blepharoplasty is now it can be with or without a skin pinch surgery which is basically where they remove if you have um, you know a lot of gathered skin here or under eye fine lines and wrinkles and laxity that is a little bit too much that you know it's not going to be resolved or mediated by just a laser or a co2 or thermage like you need surgery um, then uh, under eye skin pinch surgery will do a great job of of um, tightening up that skin so blepharoplasty is when they you know reposition that fat pad and if they do a skin pinch on top of it it tightens the skin on top now it's really important to select a, a, an astute surgeon because an astute surgeon aside from just doing the surgery patient candidate selection is really really important because you have to qualify to have a skin pinch now if you don't have enough skin this is how you can kind of know if you pinch your skin under your eye if you have laxity under the eye and it stays when you let it go you're usually a good candidate for a skin pinch surgery if you don't have enough Oh, the little doggy outside. I think I got him. This cute doggy going for a walk on the beach. Um, so what happens is if you're not a candidate for it and you don't have enough skin and you don't pass the skin pinch test and you have a skin pinch, you can get an ectropion where your eyelid looks like this because it's too tight. And if you open your mouth, it like causes this like weird ectropion thing. So you don't want to do that. You want enough skin laxity to be a candidate for surgery, and if you're not a candidate, don't have it done. Have thermage, have Fraxel, have other um, collagen-stimulating non-surgical treatments to keep that under eye smooth and snatched. And then when you come to the time where you need a skin pinch surgery, then you have that done. So that's the difference between a skin pinch and a blepharoplasty. And again, usually these surgeries are um, recommended. I recommend them to my patients when just a thermage or a CO2 or laser plus or minus a peel and under eye skincare products is just not enough. It's not cutting it, no pun intended. Just taking you guys on errands with me and I wanted to take this time um, to talk about tear trough filler and using filler in the under eye area to kind of correct for under eye hollows, under eye tear troughs or the festoons to basically correct that eyelid cheek junction, that smooth transition between the eyelid and the eye. That's what filler is really, really good for. And it's good for people who have like hollowing under the eyes. Um, but I have a love-hate relationship with tear trough filler because you have to be the right candidate and it has to be injected very carefully and precisely and injected the correct way. And it is an advanced injection, so a lot of people mess it up, especially not very highly trained injectors um, who don't have much experience with it. So um, I'm a big believer in the cannula technique um, because when you use a cannula, it starts at a, an ectopic or a distant site from the area where you're filling and it basically just starts in in the lateral surface of the um, of the face and we advance the cannula which is usually like a two centimeter um, injection tool but it's very safe and it's very effective and it also causes a lot less bruising and um, hardly even minimal swelling as, as well so when you do tear trough filler as an injector and you use a needle not only is it really traumatizing to that delicate eyelid skin and that delicate infraorbital area um, you can cause a lot of bruising which takes weeks to heal and you can cause a lot of swelling in that area so i love using a cannula because it's a safer injection technique less risk of intraarterial occlusion or vascular um, infiltration and um, it also is just much easier on the patient so a lot of times when i do tear trough filler on patients are like wow dr capel like that was easy and i was so afraid and i built myself up for nothing but it could be a disastrous um, injection if you're going to the wrong provider um, so when it's done carefully um, it the results usually last about two to three years i don't think there's any um, hard data saying uh, the duration of how long it lasts but anecdotally what i see in my patients usually they'll go for like two or three years after a tear trough injection and then like about three years later they'll come back saying oh my gosh dr Kapel, i'm aging in my eyes all of a sudden what's happening and it's usually because around that time the filler is breaking down and then you start to get like the under eye sunkenness or the hollows or whatever um, you were trying to correct before kind of comes back 
So I see tear trough filler patients all the time for consultation. They fly in from all over to see me because it is an advanced injection technique. Like they'll go get their Botox in their hometown or, you know, get their, you know, Medispa treatments. But when it comes to something like more serious um, or an advanced injection like tear trough filler, they'll come to see me. And then sometimes I'll turn them away and offer another treatment that I think would be better for them because not everyone is a good candidate for tear trough filler. If you have really, really thin skin or if you have the type of um, anatomy where it's going to migrate and you know kind of like sink down further and not stay in the area where we inject it then you're not a candidate for tear trough filler and then we'll go you know to other measures to kind of tighten up the area like with thermage or um, other uh, modalities to help improve that under eye area without doing filler or sometimes we'll just say you know maybe you're a candidate for a surgical correction and then I'll um, refer to my oculoplastics colleagues or maybe just do nothing at all you know do no harm if you're not going to be improved by an injection or a treatment then it's better off, you're better off not doing it at all so I turn people away if you're a patient of mine you know I do that sometimes or I'll say I don't think this is the right treatment for you because getting the right patient um, for tear trough filler is really really important so a patient that has hollowing that's not too much just enough um, and that we're, someone who doesn't have skin that is too thin because if the skin's too thin you get the Tyndall effect which is when you can see the hyaluronic acid filler through the skin and it like has this bluish um, discoloration or it can migrate. We always have to be careful in patients with like allergies um, or um, people who have like a lot of uh, tearing of their eyes because it can also um, exacerbate that I feel sometimes too and can make you look puffy under the eyes. So patient selection and injection technique with tear trough filler is very important when it's done correctly. It's chef's kiss, it's amazing. It can give really beautiful, long-lasting results in the right candidate. It can also be a replacement for the need for surgery for some patients. You know, if patients want to postpone surgery or they don't want to undergo an under eye blepharoplasty, tear trough filler can be really helpful with that too. But you have to be the right candidate and have the right injector do it the right, correct way. And then it just is an amazing treatment. But if not, it could be badness. Okay, you guys, I'm in the office now. I'm here to do other stuff, but of course I want to like teach you. Okay, so when you're talking about thermal for the under eye area, you need a specific thermage handpiece that is engineered specifically for the under eye. This handpiece for the under eye skin is different than the FLX handpiece that we use for like lower face rejuvenation or brow lift or you know facial thermage or neck thermage, which is actually different than if we do thermage to tighten skin on like the abdomen or other areas of the body, like crepey skin on like the arms or legs. Oh my gosh, where's the front of this? Okay, so this is like for body, this is for the eyes, and this is for the face. So in order to do thermage to tighten up the under eye area, which I love the thermage treatment for the under eye area, you need a FLX handpiece that's specific for the eyes. You also need an intraocular eye shield to be put in, which a lot of providers don't know how to do. I mean, it took me years to get good at that and I've been doing it for 20 years, so I got it down. But sometimes people say, oh, my Medispa doesn't offer thermage under the eyes. Well, that's why you need a specific eyelid tip and you need an intraocular eye shield that um, has to be placed in the eyes. So I wanna show you what an eyelid, I mean, an intraocular eye shield looks like. Okay, this is what an intraocular eye shield looks like for Fraxel. This is different than the intraocular eye shield we use for Thermage. That one's usually um, a black color and it's plastic and it protects the globe of the eye from radio frequency. This one protects the under eye area and the um, upper lid area from photons or light, which is like Fraxel. So if we do Fraxel, we put this guy in your eye. If we do the Thermage, we do the other one. And it's nothing to be afraid of, you guys. We put in numbing drops and we just put this right in. It has a little handle on it. You just pull it right back out. It's not a big deal at all. But if someone doesn't know how to put in those intraocular eye shields, it would be a disaster. So that's why a lot of people won't, you know, recommend uh, lasers or thermage or treatments for under eye because they don't have the skill to put in the intraocular eye shield and they sometimes don't even have like the specific tips they're engineered for the um, eyelid skin. So hopefully that makes sense. But when you do those treatments, those are like my two favorite treatments, lasers and thermage for tightening under eye. Um, we have, oh, here's, here's Elicor. So I would not recommend Elicor for under the eyes. Elicor is a no-no for under the eyes. It's not FDA approved for this. Elicor is really good at lower face tightening, but not for eyelids. So I'm not gonna talk about it in this video. This is Pico. So Pico 
is a, um, a pico laser and pico toning. This is good for removing um, dark circles that is secondary to pigmentation. The V-beam in the other room is good at removing dark circles that's um, secondary to underlying vasculature. They can give that purple blue hue under the skin. Pico is better at removing um, pigmentation uh, that's from melanin. So usually like more like hereditary, um, genetic predisposed, um, you know, hyperpigmentation for under the eyes. So it's really great at, at removing dark circles from hyperpigmentation. The downtime with that is about a week of some like even scabbing and bruising in the infraorbital area. So about Clear and Brilliant um, Touch, it's the Clear and Brilliant Touch is the latest platform where you can actually use two different wavelengths at the same time to treat under eyes. So you have the, um, the 1927 nanometer handpiece and you have the 1440 nanometer handpiece. This is good for pigmentation, and this is the one that I like to use to treat. Um, this guy is the one that I like to use um, to treat um, hyperpigmentation that's due to melanin uh, under the eyes. So this is uh, for people who have more like of a genetic predisposition to have like dark circles or you know kind of um, hyperpigmented under eyes or dark circles under the eyes. So when you do this, um, usually about one to three treatments based about one month apart are needed for best results. And then you don't have to worry about hiding like dark circles with like concealer and things like that. So it's one of my favorites. Pico is the same type of laser and we'll do the same thing, but it's more gnarly. It's a more aggressive next level laser that has more downtime. Clear and Brilliant is not gonna give you any downtime. Now I gotta get out of here because the reason why I came here, everybody's probably thinking, oh, is she in their office to laser herself? I'm actually not. I'm here to pick up some um, data because for our skincare line, MDR, we run all these like assays and testing and I'm here to um, gather some materials to do our own uh, research and development and testing for our skincare products because you know I'm type A, you know I'm OCD and any product I have in my MDR skincare line has to go a rigorous test of assays and analysis and research and data collection and all the things. But since we're here at the office I want to show you my lasers and devices because these are like my babies. Some women have shoes and handbags and jewelry. Some men have sports cars, race cars. I have lasers and they're my obsession and I'm obsessed. So this is my baby. This is Fraxel and this is honestly my favorite treatment for under eye rejuvenation. I've been doing this to myself on my eyes since I was like 22 or 23 years old and I was doing it more for prevention and also just you know, inadvertently giving myself anti-aging treatments on my infraorbital skin, on my eyelid skin down here, because I wanted to test the laser. I wanted to see what it felt like. I wanted to see what the downtime was, but I was also giving myself anti-aging treatments. Um, this is Clear and Brilliant. This is a, 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 a baby Fraxel. This is a, a weak, I don't wanna say weaker, but it's a less aggressive um, laser for um, under eye rejuvenation. I do it, oh, we're gonna miss the sunset. Um, I do, uh, under eye um, clear and brilliant sometimes if I don't want the downtime um, of like a Fraxel or a CO2 and I probably do it maybe like once or twice a year. Um, this is Thermage. This is the FLX platform. The FLX platform is the newest updated software. Sometimes um, offices will cut corners and buy like cheap refurbished um, Thermage devices from like 2005 and that's why you see all these um, reports of like melting of the fat and stuff like this. This is my other baby. This is V-Beam. V-Beam is also known as the V-Beam Perfecta or Pulse Dye Laser. V just stands for vascular because it's a vascular laser. But V-Beam for under eyes, oh my gosh, you guys, this is my favorite treatment for under eye dark circles when it has to do with thinning of the skin that shows that underlying vasculature under the skin. This is a whiz at erasing those. I do V-Beam on myself on my under eyes probably two or three times a year. Um, the downtime is a little bit of swelling and redness, but nothing that you can't hide with a little tinted sunscreen. But I've been doing V-Beam under my eyes for dark circles since I was in my 20s and you know I'm mid to late 40s now. So I really love this and I never have to worry about you know wearing concealer. V-Beam is my baby, I love this guy. You love how I have like this love relationship with my lasers. Um, let's see, oh wait, what? Oh, that wasn't a, that wasn't a, oh, here, let's go in here. So this laser is a CO2. This is a CO2 core. So I've done CO2 actually not that many times under my eyes. This is kind of a gnarlier, more aggressive. This isn't a blade of laser. This looks like a 
you know, like a little tiny little machine, but it's tiny but mighty. So the um, CO2 is a great under eye um, laser treatment as well. The CO2 is less aggressive than the Fraxel, which is non-ablative. So you have non-ablative and you have ablative. Non-ablative and ablative. The ablative laser, the CO2 is gonna have more downtime, more discomfort during the treatment, but it's pretty tolerable because we use medical grade um, numbing cream. Um, this is gonna be a little bit more swollen, a little bit more red, lasting about a week, versus under eye Fraxel, which is not ablative, is gonna be a little bit pink and puffy, but less redness and less swelling than the CO2, which lasts more like four or five days, not a full week. Um, and then, let's see what else we have. So one more thing, I don't have my mic on, that is I wanted to explain because I think people will be tripping on the intraocular eye shields. We only have to use these when we go really high up on the uh, under eye area. And we definitely have to use it when we do the upper lids, but for the most part, we just use these external um, eye protection goggles because when you put these on the patient, it basically covers the eye and we can, um, we can pull the skin down and as long as the laser is over bone, if you feel right here, this is your bony um, orbital rim is what we call it in dermatology. When you're pulling the skin and you're treating over bone, you don't have to put the intraocular eye shielding. Cause I know a lot of people get freaked out about this. So you don't always have to put this in when we treat the under eye, but if you want to go right up to the lash line, we need to put these in. But for most, you know, most treatments, especially when people come in for, for, for full face Fraxel, we'll just put the little external eye shields in and um, we will uh, just use those little external eye shields that go on the eye and go right up to the eye and we'll take the Fraxel laser up to like this area. So for people who get squeamish with intraocular eye shields, we don't always have to use them and you can request that we don't. Those are my toys and tools and devices that we have for under eye rejuvenation. Let's talk about V-beam lasers. So V-beam, V stands for vascular. V-beam is a, is a laser that helps treat the underlying vasculature that can give the appearance of under eye dark circles, almost with that bluish purple discoloration. And the reason why that happens is because as we get older, our skin thins over time and the epidermis and the dermis get thinner over time. So it shows that underlying vasculature more readily you know, visible than it was before. Now people can have anatomical dark circles under the eyes because of thin skin or just because of the underlying vascular network underneath their skin. But what happens is as we get older, that gets more accentuated as that skin thins out and as the infraorbital fat pads thin out over time. So V-beam works by helping retract those blood vessels from underneath the skin of the eye, which gives a really brightening, beautiful effect. And then you don't have to rely on makeup and concealer to hide the dark circles under the eyes because they're basically being treated by a laser which has long lasting results. So usually results will last anywhere from one, two, maybe three years, sometimes even forever. I typically do V-beam treatments for my under eye dark circles maybe like twice a year and I do it more just for maintenance. Um, but I don't really feel like the dark circles ever really come back, but I just do it because I have access to it and I don't want my dark circles coming back. But it's a really great treatment. Anywhere from one to three treatments are needed um, spaced one month apart and the downtime isn't bad at all it's a little bit of swelling which is kind of cool because it looks like filler and um, a little bit of like redness not even really red just almost like mild erythema like flushing that you'd get like if you got out of hot yoga or got out of like a hot shower so minimal erythema or redness that's easily coverable with a little tinted sunscreen so the downtime's not bad and the results are amazing <coughs> Okay, I'm waiting for Justin to come to bed. Look, we're gonna watch our Netflix show. But until he gets back, we're gonna keep vlogging. So one thing that I forgot to talk about is um, PRP and PRF as blood products that can be used for tear trough, like as tear trough fillers, safe alternatives to tear trough filler. So this is the thing with tear trough filler. I love doing tear trough filler. I actually served on the advisory board when Vobella got FDA approval for treatment of the tear troughs, or what we call as under eye hollows. It's a great procedure for those who need it and for those who are a good candidate for it, but not everyone's a good candidate for it. 
but a lot of um, patients and you guys in the comment section commonly ask me about PRP or PRF as filler alternatives for the tear trough area. PRP, for those of you who don't know, is just platelet-rich plasma. PRF is platelet-rich fibrin, and they're blood products that kind of act like fillers, but they're safe if it accidentally gets injected into the blood vessels because hyaluronic acid base fillers, if they get injected into the ve vessels and you get an intraarterial occlusion, it can cause blindness, it can cause stroke, it can cause a lot of bad side effects, but PRP and PRF are considered safer because if they get accidentally injected into the blood vessels, it's no big deal. But the problem is, is that those two blood products come from the blood. They're plasma, which is a blood component. So they have an affinity for, meaning they like to be inside the vessels. So once you inject PRP or PRF into the tear trough area, you may temporarily have a good result that lasts maybe a week or two. More of it's from swelling, more of it just happens to be from the product being in that area but it's gonna get circulated out of that area that it was injected. So the results don't last very long. They don't last for more than like two weeks, three weeks at max. Then some people will say the argument, well, at least it's giving like growth factors or it's giving um, you know cellular messaging signals to increase collagen synthesis, but there's much better and more effective ways to do that with lasers and topicals even, um, instead of relying on PRP and PRF to have those effects. It's considered a safe alternative to filler, but filler that lasts like two to three years is much longer duration and a much better option than PRP or PRF, in my opinion. And if you guys have had a different experience with PRP or PRF, please drop a comment in the comment section because we're all about sharing information and experiences. But as a provider and as an injector, I was never impressed with it. And you know, I was all on board when it first came out and I was excited to have a new you know, alternative to filler for tear troughs, but time and time again patients were saying you know it's not lasting long i don't see the results and have been much better off with filler just because i think people are going to ask me um so a couple years ago i actually had vo voluma in my cheekbones because i used to do i used to do more filler when i was in my 30s now that i'm in my 40s i don't rely on fillers much anymore i rely on energy-based devices and lasers but I did um, Voluma, one of my good friends who's a plastic surgeon, gave it to me maybe two or three times. Like I'd have it done every one to two years. And over time, it didn't go away, but it almost migrated up into my under eye area. So I recently, like probably about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year, like a year and a half ago, I had it all dissolved. All my Voluma that had migrated up into this area. And my, I had like my eye shape back and then I just fraxled the bejesus under my eyes. So thank you so much for hanging out with me today. We just ran around town and just vlogged about under eye treatments and under eye rejuvenation. But it's important to know that there's multiple treatments, combination of different treatments, and it's okay to go slow. Slow and steady wins the race all the time when it comes to aesthetics, skincare and rejuvenation because you're in it for the long haul and you want natural long lasting results and you don't want to look like anything's been done or fake or artificial and picking the right procedure for you um, is just you know takes a little bit of like research and time and hopefully after watching this video you know a little bit more about treatment options to make the under eye look its very best all right you guys I love you as always we'll see you next week